Hi, uh, good evening everybody and um, welcome to the Asia Society. Um, my name's Jo Lusby, I'm the co-chair of the Literary Festival and I'm absolutely delighted to see not only maskless people but a whole load of maskless people. So thank you very much for coming for what is a real pleasure and a real highlight of this year's Literary Festival. Um, the festival's happening thanks to the generosity um, of our sponsors and our supporters. This session is part of the Hildebrand series of fiction. Um, it's made possible by our generous headline author sponsors, and they include Bart Gombert, Jim Hildebrand, Lockman Rare Books, Room to Read, Jean Salata, Paul Sanikoff, Barbara Thol, and Anne and John Witt. Um, the board would also like to thank our major sponsors, um, Scholar, Croucher Science Week, Shanghui Jian, JP Morgan, Malaysian Chamber of Commerce, Bailey Gifford, Shunhing Education and Charity Trust, the US Consul General and the Ian M. Drayton Annual Giving Fund. And now with, to our headline event, it gives me real uh, pleasure to welcome tonight's speaker and the 2022 Booker Prize winner, Shihan Kado Natilaka, to Hong Kong. He'll be speaking about his second novel, The Seven Moons of Mali Almeida, and he'll be in the expert hands tonight of the moderator, Kitmina Hiwaji. Kitmina works for the Centre for Asian Philanthropy and Science and was previously political advisor to the British High Commission in Colombo. There will be time for Q&A at the end, um, so make sure to please be storing up all of your questions. There's books available at the back. Um, you'll have seen them as you came in, so please do support your local bookseller. Um, and Sheehan will be around to make, sign some copies at the end. So please join me in welcoming Sheehan to the stage. Thank you very much. Sheehan, uh, welcome to Hong Kong. It's great Thank to you have very you. Much. Uh, we were talking backstage, and you were telling me that you had been to Hong Kong last 10 years ago. Um, how has it been since? Has anything changed? Um, so I was there. Well, you can tell me if things have changed. Uh, I, I was there 10 years ago with the first book, uh, yeah, with Chinaman. Uh, and I was staying in Kowloon uh, and for five days. The and dark had, side. Had, is that the dark side? It, oh, I loved it. <laughs> and um, yeah, had a great time. And it's been too long. So this time it was a short visit. Uh, came with my wife. And um, yeah, but... Met some nice people and had some great talks, and it's been good. Um, I haven't noticed any change. Why has a lot changed? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Not that I know of. I, know. Okay. I just wanted to see, yeah. you know. Um, speaking of family, um, being a literary rock star, you wanted to become a rock star, you wanted to become a rock musician. Um, a how bass player, to a be bass fair. Player. Okay. Yeah. Not, not, not lead guitarist. No, okay. no. Um, what has the family response been like to winning uh, the Booker Prize? Uh, how have the kids in particular reacted? So I, I have a six-year-old and an eight-year-old. And um, yeah, I think, see, they, they went to school and they got standing ovations. And uh, yeah, <laughs> my little boy is right. He goes, Dada, is there a Booker for kids? And uh, I said, not yet, but you know, you can be the first. So he's He's writing his little stories. He, he can barely write, but there's a lot of illustrations. Quite violent, weird stories. I don't know where he gets them, gets it from. <laughs> but um, yeah, yeah, they've both been enjoying the attention. And uh, my wife's been bearing the brunt of it. Um, uh, my moods while struggling through writing this. And now um, while I'm traveling, uh, she has to deal with these two psychos. But um, yeah, we've been holding. And you know, she, I, I think she appreciated being able to come to Hong Kong and have some time off. But yeah, the families were all very surprised by this, and uh, but of course delighted. And you visited now twelve cities since Christmas, mm. and we are the last stop. So you have left the best to last before you take a break in New Zealand for a while. Mm. Um, I wanted to kind of talk about your process of writing. Uh, before kind of going into Seven Moons. And what the starting point was a quote that you had done amongst your hundreds of interviews that you have given over the past couple of weeks. Um, and you say, write only if you find a story, will not leave you alone, and you are the only one who can tell it the way it should be told. Now, I have massive imposter syndrome. And I'm sure most Sri Lankans are brought up in a way that imposter syndrome is kind of built into us. How do you know that a story is yours to tell? Well, I th OK, so it started with me. I mean, I worked as an advertising copywriter in an agency. And I think, 
it's quite common. A lot of copywriters have a little screenplay in, in the bottom drawer. They say, you know, once I'm done with this, I'm going to yeah, write the screenplay, write this novel. And uh, yeah, I, I was no different. I had all these stories. Um, I suppose coming up with the idea is, is the easy part. You know, we all have ideas. But then actually researching it and writing the next 400 pages, that's the challenge. And I do remember um, the, the first novel, this, this idea that the greatest cricketer of all time could have been unfortunate enough to have been playing for Sri Lanka in 1985. That was appealing to me, because I remember watching Sri Lankan cricket at that time, and we had this assembly line. We still do, assembly line. We don't have gas or petrol or competent leaders, but we have assembly line of mystery spinners. And, uh, and these guys would turn up, uh, and we were talking before, um, when we beat Australia during the height of the Aragale, the struggle, um, yeah, this guy Prabhat Jaisuria, who no one heard of, comes in, takes six wickets, and I don't know what's happened to him now. Maybe he's disappeared like Pradeep Matthew. But I, and also, it, it just appealed to me the idea that, is it possible to write a Sri Lankan novel that doesn't talk about the war, about ethnic conflict? Because I think, at the time, most stories, it was, uh, you know, Tamil girl, Singhala boy, a doomed love story. The war is always a character there. And I thought, is it possible to write a story which doesn't mention the war? We just because in the midst, in the you know, in the height of the war, we won this World Cup in 1996, which no one expected, and we had this brief, well, not so brief. It lasted a good 10 years of this golden age, and uh, I, I put this down in my. So when I was sitting there, you know, at my desk, I'd have, you know, I'd be writing my copy, but I'd have all these novel ideas which I'd have in my bottom drawer, and I thought someone should write this. Someone should write this story. And I waited a couple of years, and I realized no one is sitting there writing stories about left arm leg spinners who played for Sri Lanka. <laughs> and uh, I thought, well, maybe I should attempt it. And, and I think you're right. It doesn't leave you alone. And so I started, and I'm not a morning person. I've become one. I started waking up at 4 in the morning and uh, typing my story about Pradeep Matthew and then going to work. And I did that for a good six months before I ended up taking a break from advertising to do this. But um, and I wasn't sure, like, when you're right, sitting in Colombo writing a story about an obscure cricketer, you're not sure it's going to be read in UK or the US. But I just thought it was an interesting story. And I thought someone should write it. And I knew that no one else would. And perhaps no one could write. And this is the arrogance of writers. You have, you know, we suffer from massive insecurity. But we also have this arrogance that no one can tell it like me. And um, the idea to get a drunken uncle to narrate it. That's when it really fired my imagination, because I thought, um, you know, as, as a young writer in the 90s, uh, we had a lot of um, South Asian role models. I mean, you know, Salman Rushdie's Midnight's Children opened a lot of doors for everyone. And at the time, Michael Ondaatje had uh, won the Booker Prize. Ramesh Gunasekara was at his prime. And, uh, and I still think he's, he's written tremendous work even recent times. But I knew I could never write as elegantly a, as these guys. But I thought I could write like a drunken uncle. I thought I, uh, that's something I can, I can pull off. And the inspiration there was a gentleman called Karl Muller, who is uh, not as celebrated as the other two, or even, say, Shyam Selvadurai, who was writing at the time, who was writing you know, queer literature, quite groundbreaking, funny boy at that time. But Karl Muller, he was published, uh, I think he was published by Penguin in India. But one thing that struck me is that, that Burger trilogy, Jam Fruit Tree, and so on. Um, you know, he wrote how we spoke. It was just this about this burger family who got into fights and uh, slept with each other's spouses and got drunk. But it was written in that Sri Lankan tone of voice. And so I thought, OK, I'm, I'm going to attempt this. And um, so that was Chinaman. And I mean, it did, did OK. I mean, it, um, I didn't expect it to be published outside of Sri Lanka. It ended up being published in India, the UK, and finally the US, who are not known for their love of cricket. Um, and um, then I suppose, like, I, when you write your first novel, you, you just think, OK, if it gets published uh, outside of my hometown, that'll be an achievement. You don't think that you're going to have a career as a novelist. And I don't think I ever thought I had a career as a novelist. I was, I was always a part-time novelist who had a day job until October, until the strange events of October. Um, and similarly with this book, it was, um, I will, and now we've got to fast forward to around 2012, 2013. So I'm in Singapore now. Um, and yeah, Chinaman has now done some business. And everyone's asking you, what is your next trick? And I had no idea. 
I knew that I was sick of talking about cricket. Um, also, Sri Lankan cricket was on its uh, downward slope, and I'd stopped watching the game. We peaked and, in 2014. Uh, Yes, tw uh, 2011 we were in the World Cup final. Yeah, so I wrote this book, uh, Chinaman thinking that we'll win a few more World Cups by the time I was done. I'm still waiting, we're all still waiting for that. But uh, I thought, um, okay, I'm done with cricket, maybe what Sri Lanka needs is a good ghost story. And um, that was the start of it, uh, thinking what if Sri Lanka's dead could speak. Because I noticed with every tragedy that happens, and we, I mean, I went back to 1989, but you know, even recent tragedies like the 2019 Easter attacks, not that long ago, but you notice how the tragedy happens and then there's many conflicting narratives around it. Uh, and everyone arguing about whose fault it is, whose fault it's not, it's not us, it was those guys who did it. And that just annoyed and disappointed me. And I just thought the living are obviously gonna recreate their own narratives, but what if we allowed the dead to speak? And what would they say about Sri Lanka, about what, uh, what the country had done to them? And again, the story wouldn't leave me alone. And I had to, uh, and, and this was a much more challenging book to write, and it took, uh, took, a, took about seven years to do. But um, again, I knew no one is sitting there talking about 1989. Uh, it seems like ancient history. And so I thought, yeah, maybe I'll quit my job again and attempt this and, and, and try it. So I think that's the, you have to, because also, it takes as long to write a bad book as it does to write a decent one. That's the sad thing that uh, writers have to deal with. And I, uh, you know, um, you spend uh, two years writing 300 pages and realize it, it's no good. It's quite heartbreaking. And um, I think the difference between writers and uh, civilians is that uh, a, a normal, sane person will write 300 pages, realize it's bad, and decide to do something better with their time, but a writer will keep going back. And I, I did that, I abandoned it, went and wrote some short stories, uh, wrote some children's uh, fiction, and, or well, children's stories, and uh, I kept coming back to it because I thought there is potential to, through the ghosts of Sri Lanka's past, to not only write a murder mystery, but talk about the things that we're not talking about. Um, and I do, I have a new story that I'm not gonna talk about, but it won't leave me alone. Um, and um, hopefully when I'm done talking about this one, I can go back to my boring life, to back to writing it. Um, but yeah. Excellent, uh, so you wrote Chinaman while you were in the UK. Um, no, no, while I was in Sri, Sri Lanka, Lanka. yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. and, and one of the big things with Asian literature in particular is this insider versus outsider narrative, because a lot of Asian culture and probably developing country culture uh, is represented by the outsider. Um, but when you, the, the people you spoke about, the Michael Ondaatjis, the Karl Mullers, and yourself, you, you've lived a migrant life, so to speak. You, you've lived in other countries as well. Does it help to be an insider who lives outside to be able to portray what's going on in, in a way that is accessible to a wide audience? So I don't know if I'm a, well, I'm certainly an insider. And every time I, I, I get itchy feet every five years. And uh, now, yeah, since we had kids, I've been in Sri Lanka eight years. And um, yeah, perhaps it's time to, to move. Uh, and and I, because I feel I need to go outside to get that perspective. But whenever I'm, out, I'm outside, and I've lived in London, in Singapore, in New Zealand, and uh, I've tried to write about those places. And for some reason, either you feel you don't have permission to do it, or you don't know if you have anything fresh to say about it. And But this outside-insider thing, I mean, you mentioned Ondaatje. Um, I always come back to, I think it's Anil's ghost, where he mentions this concept of waving at helicopters, where, because um, most stories about the, whatever it's called, the so-called developing world, the third world, the global south, um, especially in the 80s, I mean, I grew up watching Vietnam War movies, and it always, and another example is The Killing Fields, um, it's always a, a white protagonist comes into this dystopia, has an experience, and the final scene is always them having had this adventure, leaving in a helicopter, crying, while their friend, the fixer, is waving at the helicopter, right? We, and, um, and then the, the guy goes back to New York and writes their story, wins their Pulitzer, and maybe comes back. But I always wondered, what about that poor guy waving at the helicopter? There's no Pulitzer for him. 
he's got to go back to his uh, crap life in this dystopia and live, live it out. And I thought, who is writing that story? And it always appealed to me to, that that story is far more interesting than, than the outsider perspective. And it did irritate me even in recent times. You see um, Sri Lankan novels. I read a lot where, and it's, 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 it's by, by a Sri Lankan, usually expat, and usually the story is an expat coming back to Sri Lanka, getting involved in a bomb blast or something. But it's this, they repeat the same scene. The last scene is them going and leaving for Boston or Paris and waving at some other guy. So it's almost like we have sublimated that thing and saying that our countries are not livable and that the only solution is to get the hell out of there, which, you know, judging by the lines at the passport office, a lot of people are taking that option. But um, that's not a solution for most of the populace. And I've always been interested in those who are left behind who have to live in this, these societies. So um, I've always seen that story as, as the thing that I can write. Uh, but I do always have to come back, even when I'm li like when I was in Singapore, I was writing the first draft of this, but it didn't really take shape until you're on the ground, sort of smelling the air, listening to the rhythms of how people speak, and reading the newspapers and see. I mean, Sri Lankan newspaper, there's absurdities every single day, right? And uh, you know, 2022, you can write. I'm sure there'll be plenty of novels and films written about just those 12 months and what happened. So I always tend to write when I'm on the ground. But yeah, I think you do need to, to go away to get that perspective. But I always tend to come back in the end. And speaking of 2022, um, would you have written Seven Moons differently had you written it after 2022? Um, I mean, Sri Lanka was in the news. So I'm, I'm guessing I don't need to give much context to what went on. Uh, a quick recap would be we stormed the president's house. Uh, the president left, but nothing has changed. Um, that's kind of the a quick summary of what has go been going on. You're so cynical. Why? Uh, wow. <laughs> I, I'm a political <laughs> advisor by profession. I have to be. <laughs> uh, so would you have written it differently if you had kind of gone through that and then how would that have ex influenced your writing? Yes, certainly, because I remember when I was writing it uh, um, in 2015, and this is when the the Yahapalnia government came in, and there was a semblance of hope. And I, it occurred to me when I was writing about these gruesome events of 1989, will people believe that any of this happened? Because, of course, you know, this is a fantastical novel. There's talking animals and demons and ghosts. But a lot of the, the, um, the background information is based on history. And I thought, will people believe that these terrible things happened? And of course, the book took so long to write. I mean. It, it was a great marketing plan on my part to have it come out when Sri Lanka collapses again, but this was not the, you know, I, I'm no Nostradamus, even though there has been Are a you part of Matthew, the conspiracy? Uh, well, there's many conspiracies, um, but um, I, yeah, so I certainly, I, so when I was writing it, I thought I'm writing, I'm writing ancient history, and maybe it'll, especially younger Sri Lankans who were born after, in the 90s and after that, can go, because a lot of them aren't aware. I mean, they're aware of 83, 89, but you know, this stuff is not being taught in schools. And I, I found, um, strange thing is my first book, um, my fan base was mainly middle-aged men who were obsessed with cricket, and uh, those were my groupies. But with this one, it's been, uh, it's, it's cut across, and I've had a lot of young people at readings saying, yeah, we didn't, uh, because of this book, we went back and read about 89, and of course, the real story is far more gruesome than anything here. Um, so, yes, it, it was quite strange that it came out at a time when, uh, you know, there was no problem with uh, people believing that Sri Lanka was a dystopia, because it came out the same year when Sri Lanka was collapsing for a completely different set of reasons. And, um, yeah, I, I guess I would have written it differently if, I'm, if I was writing it. Now, for many other reasons, I think, also um, writing from the point of view of a gay man, when I attempted this in 2013, 2014, I wasn't really thinking about this conversation about cultural appropriation and all that, but that's something I pay a lot more heed to now when I'm writing. Um, so yeah, it's strange how things worked out, but um, yeah, it came out, we were in a petrol queue for four days, and then, I, well, my wife was in a petrol queue. I, I, I didn't, uh, I said, you know, this is, 
this is Mad Max Fury Road. We, we are for, though they never ran out of petrol, uh, you notice. They ran out of everything else except for petrol in Mad Max movies. That's the, uh, <laughs> so inaccurate. When the apocalypse comes, petrol's the first thing to go. Um, <laughs> but I remember, um, yeah, I was walking my kids to class and I got this text saying, wow, long listed for the booker. And it was, what a surreal year it's been since then. And so let's, let's get to the book, but before that, uh, I know you've uh, prepared a reading of the book, so let's have a short reading, and then let's get to uh, Seven Moons. So I'm going to read one of the more darker parts of the book. This is where Mali Almeida... So the original title for this was Chats with the Dead, and it was um, originally Mali Almeida, this dead war photographer, going around the afterlife chatting to the victims of Sri Lanka's wars, and he chats to ghosts as well as demons. And this is set on a, a, leaf, a leafy suburb. There's this beautiful house where young men and women are taken and interrogated. And there's, on the rooftop, there's a demon sitting there. And the demon deconstructs colonialism and uh, talks about who is to blame, which is what demons do in these kind of books. Uh, uh, what, who is to blame for Sri Lanka's maladies? And suddenly the cold transforms into something familiar. Not something, perhaps more an absence of a thing. An emptiness that stretches to the horizon. A void that has known you forever. When your dear dada departed, you ran through different scenarios every night while trying to sleep. Maybe he sensed you were queer. Maybe he wished you were him. Maybe you reminded him of her. Maybe he hoped you'd be worth more. You relived every sullen word, every petulant glance, every slight, every put down, until your chest was hollow. You feel it, do you not? That is the energy. The hollowness and that loathing were not entirely unpleasant. Despair always begins as a snack that you nibble on when bored, and then becomes a meal that you have thrice a day. Who do you blame for this mess? Was it the colonials who screwed us for centuries? or the superpowers that are screwing us now. There is a terrible scream from down below when the roof spits out black shadows which the dead priest sucks up through what, what looks like a large straw. Who screwed us? Well, the Portuguese assumed the missionary position. The Dutch took us from behind. By the time the Brits came along, we were already on our knees with our hands behind our backs and our mouths open. Well, I'm glad we were colonized by the British, you say. I suppose, better than being slaughtered by the French, says the priest, or enslaved by the Belgians, or gassed by the Germans, or raped by the Spaniards. Sometimes I think, when I think of the mess that this country is in, I think it might be better to let the Chinese or the Japanese buy us over, let the Yankees and the Soviets own our thoughts, or let the Indians take care of our Tamil problem, like we let the Dutch take care of our Portuguese problem. You are now sitting in the shadows and breathing in the void. The dead priest sits across from you and whispers into the dark. This island has always been connected. We traded spices, gems, and slaves with Rome and Persia long before history books were invented. Our people, too, have always been tradable. Look at today. The rich send their kids to London. The poor send their wives to Saudi. European pedophiles sun on our beaches. Canadian refugees fund our terror. Israeli tanks kill our young. And Japanese salt poisons our food. It is then that you realize there is somewhere you have to be and it is not here. And that if you stay here any longer, you will forget why you have arrived. The British sell us guns and the Americans train our torturers. What chance do any of us have? The priest has gone, grown muscular and crawls towards you as she speaks. Her voice doubles, trebles, and then multiplies. You recognize this walk and this growl. You pull away from the shadow and it blocks your exit. The Brits left us an unpolished pearl and we have spent 40 years filling this oyster with shit. It now has its face against yours and you are no longer sure if it is a he or a she. You feel the cold and the empty roaring through you. His eyes are made from a thousand other eyes and her voice is a thousand other voices. That hum at the edge of our hearing is not a he or a she or a him or a it or a they. It is a cacophony. 
Here's the stinking truth. Take a good whiff. We have fucked it up all by ourselves. The Mahakali's arms are all around you, and someone else's arms are all around you, and everyone's arms are around you. Say it once more, louder and slower. Its teeth are as black as its eyes, and when its mouth grows wider, you see its black tongue and the eyes pierce, peering out from its throat. We have fucked it up all by ourselves. So to those who haven't read the book yet, the first thing that comes, ac com comes across is that you've written it in second person. Why did you to make that decision? So this is, so there was a lot of problem solving to be done because, um, and I remember part of the research was I, you know, I went to haunted houses. I didn't see a single ghost, thank thankfully. I don't intend on seeing one, um, but I, yeah, I visited clairvoyance, watched horror movies, um, yeah, read about the afterlife and um, near-death experiences, and none of it was useful because most ghost stories, you never see the ghost till the final act, and then depending on the special effects budget, it's a good movie or a bad movie, and some, some you never see the ghost at all. And, um, but on this, it, it was, you meet the ghost on page one who says, hi, I'm a ghost. And I, I, I wondered, okay, what does a ghost sound like? What does a disembodied voice look like? And um, you, you usually describe your protagonist. I mean, I can describe what he used to look like, but especially when his body is being chopped up in the opening chapter, I wondered what does he sound like? And uh, it took a while to kind of figure this out because I wrote it in the third person, I wrote it in the first person, but I figured that the thing that perhaps, if anything, survives the death of your body, it's the voice in your head. And the voice in my head is in the second person. It always has been. It's, uh, it still is. It's telling me you, sh you should make sure you wrap this up quickly so you don't miss your flight. And it's almost like an external coach or uh, someone berating you. Or, and this made sense to me. And I, and I think with, with any book, it doesn't exist till you have a voice. Um, you can have a plot, you can have ideas, you can have characters, but until the thing has a voice, unlike with the first book with the drunken uncle voice, it's only when that happens that the, that the book flows. And so I tried out the second person, and uh, before I knew it, I had 20, 30 pages. And it's only later that I kind of deconstructed it and analyzed it. And, and the, we do it in the, in the book as well, where he thinks, who is this voice? What is the voice of your thoughts? Um, is, because we all assume that our thoughts come from ourselves, but sometimes you do something and you think, what was I thinking? Why did I do that? It's almost like, did someone else whisper that thought in my ear? And, and he wonders sometimes, is, is he the person behind his actions or is this some external force, some spirit whispering bad ideas in his head? And I suppose it, yeah, afterwards when I justified it, it made sense and I think the book speculates who is the you telling the story? Is it Mali Almeida or is it the voice of his conscience? Is it the voice of his soul across different centuries? Um, but that stuff came later. Initially, just it felt right and it, and it flowed, but that, that was the reason I did it. And um, there haven't been a lot of examples of novels in the second person. Uh, Bright Lights, Big City is the famous one. Uh, Mohsin Hamid writes uh, Reluctant Fundamentalist, uh, uh, how, to, how to Get Ahead in Rising Asia. So those were, second, so those were things that I turned to. I also turned to, um, Choose Your Own Adventure books, uh, which I don't know if everyone remembers them, but they were quite big in the 80s, this, um, uh, where it, one of the characteristics was you could choose different endings and all that, but it was always in the second person. And it, it has a curious effect of it kind of puts you into the action, but it's also got this kind of distance to it as well. But I guess the short answer, it, it just worked on the page, and sometimes you just go with, inst well, not sometimes, all the time, when, uh, when you're writing well, you're going by instinct and you're, you think about it only later. But it seemed to work, so I, I just went with it. And in terms of making up the rules of the afterlife, uh, because, and that's a fundamentally important thing in this book because it is, after all, a ghost story and about the afterlife. Uh, it seemed as if, I mean, it, it's the, the perspective that you bring are very much to do with kind of the Buddhist influence of the afterlife, the, the kind of the the ghosts, the deities uh, who are hungry, etc., and maybe some to more to do with the Mahavamsa 
uh, version of Buddhism that is uh, practiced more in East Asia than the Theravada. So more the Mahayana Buddhism as opposed to Theravada, Theravada Buddhism, yeah. Which, uh, yeah. which we practice. Yeah. So how did you kind of land on that? Because uh, the afterlife in itself, there is so much, there's a spectrum of opinions about that. So how did you land on this version of the rules of the afterlife? Again, a lot of trial and error. So I, I went to the religious texts, and uh, and I think there's elements of, I mean, the idea of, oh, thank you. Is that Samahan? One, oh, wonderful. Um, I think, um, so I, I went to, and you still have this, uh, this Judeo-Christian notion of the light. And I also got that from near-death experiences, which are quite well documented. And they all mention this idea of, uh, you know, when I flatline on the operating table, I see the light, and there's a guide beckoning me towards the light. So I borrowed from that tradition. Um, with the, I mean, the afterlife as a bureaucracy may have been my invention of uh, sitting in parcel offices and passport offices. But one thing I, I realized was, um, A, you can go to all the philosophers and the religious teachers and... Uh, and the clairvoyance and the ghost hunters, nobody knows a thing. And uh, the first book I could interview cricketers and drunks. With this, you know, interviewing a ghost is quite difficult unless you want to really go into the dark side. And so I realized, okay, I'm, I'm free to borrow from all these traditions and construct my own uh, version of it. But you have to set the rules because it always irritates me in a fantasy novel. Suddenly, uh, you know, at the end, you find out he can breathe fire or he can get invisible, and they never see that at the beginning, and it's almost like the author is just making up stuff as they're going along. And I wanted to make sure that at least I had consistent rules, and I had a bunch of them, you know, you could change the temperature in the room, you could command insects, and I think my editor, Natanya Jans, she said, okay, let's, let's, not, let's not freak out here, let's just do what, what, what's necessary for the plot. And so I figured, okay, what does a ghost do all day? Uh, what, uh, where can they go? Can they talk to humans? Can, what can they do? Uh, and it made sense to me that you, know, you can't go wherever you want, otherwise all the ghosts will end up in the Maldives or Paris or somewhere. You know, why would you sit in Colombo in a cemetery, right? So um, it, it made sense also like with ghost stories, uh, so you could only go where your body has been, which made sense. That's why you see ghosts either in cemeteries or in the house that they lived in. Um, also the wind. So I was writing this, uh, you know, I, I have young children and, you know, uh, they, were, they were one and three at one point and the only time I could work was three in the morning and I'd be working three, four in the morning and suddenly the wind would like shut a door, or blow a window and then suddenly I'd, I'd jolt and I'd wonder if there was something in the room telling me the story. Uh, so the wind was a useful device for Mali Almeida to go around Colombo. But I think the important breakthrough was the idea that you can go wherever your name is spoken. And um, that, it allowed me, because I was writing a murder mystery, and the, I mean, I think it's a pretty conventional murder mystery in that you have suspects, and you have a ticking clock, and so on. The only difference is the corpse is the detective. So, uh, but how does the corpse solve their own murder? So this device was useful that wherever someone mentioned the word Mari Almeida, he could immediately go there and see what is happening, and and investigate the crime. So I think those were the three main rules. But also, I think there was a more poignant tone to that in that you die a second death when the last person on Earth mentions your name. And uh, that idea that uh, you never want to be forgotten. And Mali Almeida, uh, one of his missions is the photographs under his bed. He wants that legacy. He wants his life's work to be seen. So I think those were the three main rules. And then the idea of seven moons, um, you know, we have it in our culture, hat the, the after seven, we believe that the spirit um, hovers around for seven days before it goes to their resting place. Therefore, on the seventh day, we have uh, arms giving or so on. We have one after 90 moons as well, the th three month thing. So this, this was a useful device to use. So you have like, he has seven days to solve this murder. And then, then I just populated it with different victims, but also the different ghosts also represented different factions of Sri Lanka. And I think the central theme of the book is uh, basically, I think the central theme of, of Sri Lanka's crises is that how do we deal with our past, the ghosts of our past? Do we bury them, do we forget about them, or do we dig them up and scrutinize them? And it seems the approach is always, you know, bygones, forget about it, no point going back and digging up that stuff, let's just move on. Which is a privilege and it's convenient for those who can move on, but for many, 
those wounds, those scars have not healed. And so I think that debate is there when you have the two characters of Dr. Rani and uh, Sena Patirana. One is saying, look, your life is over, just make peace with, walk to the light and forget about things and move on. Whereas the other is saying, no, that's exactly what they want you to do. You should go back and correct the injustices. And so, so I think constructing that afterlife allowed me to also explore the intricacies of the plot and Mali Almeida's story, but also Sri Lanka's relationship to its past. Um, but this stuff, it didn't, this is why it takes so long to write novels, because it took me a while to kind of figure out these are the rules and these are the ones I can stick to, and then how can ghosts talk to humans? Is it possible? And there's a variety of quite complicated ways in which they can through dreams and uh, through these uh, dodgy clairvoyants like the, cl uh, the crow man. But yeah, it all came very slowly, but uh, after a while, it, once we had the rules down, then I knew, okay, these are the restrictions you worked, uh, I had to work through, and uh, I was allowed to be consistent, and, and it had its own internal logic. I, I have to ask, you mentioned earlier that you met a few clairvoyants. Mm. Uh, did you meet any clairvoyants that work for any of the politicians? Mm. I, uh, I have to give some context here. Every Sri, major Sri Lankan politician has their own clairvoyant, and Sri Lankan presidents have declared elections based on what the astrologer has said and lost that election. <laughs> so have you met any of them? Yeah, so in an economic crisis, we rely on astrologers rather than economists. Um, and uh, yeah, I no, not none of the rock star astrologers. I went to these very, yeah, these little shacks. And uh, it was, I mean, I, I went in as a skeptic. And it, a few times I sat down and they'd say like, oh, there's a lady standing behind you. And um, she's, um, but she's looking after you. Did a lady in your life ever die? And you know, you know what, what cold reading is. So I was quite skeptical about it. Um, but no, no, no. Uh, it was quite creepy because you know sometimes they'll they'll hit on things that uh, bang on about your past, and and so you wonder is the is the lady sitting behind me now? Did she come to Hong Kong with me? And is she looking after me? Is she the second person voice in my ear? Who is that lady? Uh, but um, no, no, I didn't. Uh, the celebrity ones, I think, yeah, you've got to, they call it, uh, you've got to sow your seed. And I was like, what, what sow your seed means? You've got to put some money in the thing. So um, with the ones I went to, I could get by with a few hundred rupee notes. You I think with won the, the booker yet. No, no, yeah. then they would have asked it in crypto yeah. or dollars from me. <laughs> but uh, no, no, I, I'd be fascinated to see um, what happened to these astrologers now who... Uh, said that we uh, the economic crisis will be fine and all that they've uh, kind of gone into hiding now no yeah probably part of your next book mm. they could be characters uh, i want to kind of touch on 1989 because it's a very complicated period in sri lankan political mm. history and just sri lankan history in general because effectively there were three wars going on there was a marxist insurrection in the south uh, a separatist war going on in the north and there was an Indian peacekeeping force that was in the country that no one wanted. Uh, and alleged, I should say allegedly, the government was arming groups to fight them as well. And then there were allegedly government kill squads who were going around basically taking people off the streets. What was your personal experience during that time? So I, and I talk about this in the book, I lived in the Colombo bubble. So I was um, yeah, a middle class kid living in Colombo and we were, I would say, largely insulated from the war. I mean, we, there were, our city was full of checkpoints, uh, schools would close down, there'd be curfews, a bomb would go off, there'd be assassinations. But I remember, all I remember of 89, the, is and of eighty three is the body is on the side of the road and you'd and you know your your mum would turn your face away but you you'd see them bodies burning on tires, and you'd ask who are those people and no one had answer because no one knew because uh, uh, a burning body looks to, and he mentions that when we're he held to the flame Singhalese and Tamils and Marxists and capitalists and radicals and moderates all look alike and it was the case of. You didn't know why these bodies were there, whether they were army or LTT or, or suspected of that, and you don't know who put, put them there. And um, my experience was, see now my wife had a very different experience. She grew up in the plantations during the JVP time where the plant, and her dad was a planter, and they had a very harrowing experience. Um, and um, so I heard those stories, and I suppose I felt that guilt that uh, 
you know, Colombo tends to go, the bubble tends, like even now, we had the economic crisis, but if you went to Colombo in December, during a uh, power crisis, that big phallic symbol was fully lit up, uh, the, the light, Christmas lights were on, Colombo was partying, uh, you know, so-called dollar crisis, people spending obs obscene amounts of money and having fun, and it's almost like, yeah, the economic crisis is happening somewhere else, and I, I did feel, growing up in Colombo, it's the war was happening in another country, but so, Maybe I had that guilt. I knew, I knew that this, this period was the darkest the time, and so when I was looking for a period to set this novel, that was the obvious place. But um, I suppose I felt the guilt that I didn't really experience. I didn't really suffer like most of the country did. So I, I talked to friends who'd grown up in Jaffna, who'd grown up in Trinco, uh, people who were in the army. I, I managed to talk to some ex-child soldiers who were in exile, and... Um, so I, I constructed it through that, and of course that period is very well documented. But the idea of the Colombo bubble is prevalent in this book because Mali Almeida, I suppose, is a, is a braver, more idealistic uh, version of what I, 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 I thought I could be because I, all I did was, uh, yeah, I went to school and I watched uh, uh, Vietnam War movies on VHS, and uh, then I wrote a novel about it 30 years later. But um, a lot of people had a much more a much more profound and a much more terrifying experience. And um, whereas Mali Almeida, he, he had a comfortable uh, Colombo existence, but he decides to go out there and document uh, these things. And um, of course, he pays the ultimate price for it. So, and, and, he, and he keeps criticizing his lover, Didi, about you're, you're stuck in this bubble, saving the trees, what are you doing for this country? So I think, yeah, so my experience was quite muted and it's only later when I researched uh, the thing that I realized the true horror of what, what went on. And, and in terms, and it was this around the time that you also moved to New Zealand? Mm. So yeah, 89, 90, family moved to New Zealand, to Wanganui, which I'm returning to tomorrow. And um, yeah, and I suppose that, and then in the aftermath of 1990, we forget that whole, that whole generation of political leadership were assassinated. I mean, we lost a lot of great p potential leaders and political talent where, and again, unsolved murders. You know, b people ask me why, if you're writing, you say you're writing detective stories, why are there no detectives in these stories? I mean, the first book is a, a missing person story, but it's a drunk sports journalist who is doing the investigation. And in this, it's a, it's a dead war photographer doing it. And I, I had to think about, then I realized, in Colombo, we don't have Hercule Poirot or Sherlock Holmes smoking the pipe, looking at the corpse and solving the crime. The murders, they, if the cops are there and there's a quote in that, what are we doing, boss? Are we covering this up or are we investigating it? And, um, this, and none of these assassinations, you know, there's lots of conspiracy theories and then we forget about it. And it seemed like the journalists, these are the people who go out and try and find the truth and ultimately uh, pay with their lives. And um, yeah, so I think that's, that's, that's why uh, I think all my protagonists tend to be these foolhardy journalists who, who go after the truth. And, and in terms of the main characters, so Mali is, you've said before, that is based on Richard De Zoiza, who's a journalist who was killed um, allegedly by the government. Um, and Rani is uh, loosely based on Dr. Uh, Rajini Sri uh, Tiranagama. <laughs> Uh, who was a doctor in the North, a uh, Tamil moderate, who was killed by the LTTE. Uh, were these characters developed in a way to be pay homage to these characters, or was it you using their characters um, as kind of inspiration to base something that was based in that time? So I think when you start writing, you always think, okay, I'm going to base this character. This character's a lot like my auntie who's uh, quite gossipy and uh, talks a lot, and I'm going to base it on her. But I think when you keep writing, the characters, and this is the magic moment, when they start speaking to you in their own voice. And so, yes, you're right. That was the starting point. Like, when I was looking at Chats with the Dead, I thought, okay, what are the three, the three biggest unsolved murders uh, of, of that period? And yes, Richard de Soisa, the, the slain activist, um, Dr. Rajini Thiranagama, who was a Tamil moderate, who was killed for the crime of documenting LTT's uh, uh, atrocities. And a lesser known character called Daya Patirana, who was perhaps one of the first victims of the JVP insurrection. 
And I thought, okay, what if uh, these three guys were talking to each other in the afterlife, what it would look like? So you start that way. But I think with different drafts, uh, Mali Almeida is not Richard de Soisa. Um, Richard de Soisa was not a war photographer. He, um, as far as I know, he wasn't a gambler. Um, but he was a, a closet gay man who you know, had a girlfriend, but uh, also had many secret lo gay love affairs. And I think that's the only thing that I retained from that. So ultimately, I, I spoke with a lot of people who knew Richard. And you got to understand, Richard's uh, death because we were used to journalists going missing and activists uh, being killed. But Richard's um, death really shook up the Colombo bubble because finally, wow, the government can come after one of us, an English-speaking, uh, middle-class, uh, uh, educated guy who was like quite a quite prominent. He was a newsreader, he was an actor. And the fact that he was slain and his body was dumped and, uh, and still, you're right, uh, allegedly killed by the forces, no one has uh, claimed anything that has, hasn't been solved. So it started there, but I think Mali Almeida became his own character, and I think the idea of making him a war photographer was useful to the plot because he had these photographs that he wanted seen, and he naively thought that, because uh, it always occurred to me, the, you know, the kids say, you know, photos or it didn't happen. The idea that, um, you know, 1983, the, we only have the same photographs that keep getting recycled every July when the internet decides to talk about Black July. Even our war, we just, uh, very few photographs that survive. And I wonder, were there no one with cameras at these places? Or is there a box under some photographer's bed that has the full story of these uh, atrocities? Um, so I think Mali, he evolved. And then I had to explain, why is this guy going to these dangerous places when he can live a comfortable Colombo existence? And the idea of him being a gambler and him seeing everything as a calculated risk. And also the idea of him being a closeted gay man with a pretty uh, voracious sexual appetite. So I think he couldn't express himself properly in, in Colombo society. So that made sense that he would go on these dangerous adventures knowing the risks so he could you know, have his fun but take these photographs which he thought could end the war. So <coughs> sorry, um, I think Richard de is the starting point, but Mali Almeida, the characters in the end evolved into their own people. And, and one last question before we go to the audience for some questions as well. Um, when you describe this complexity of the politics, the economics, and everything around it, the ethnic issues, et cetera, uh, and you're also trying to uh, communicate this complexity to a wider audience. Like you said, you're not just trying to write to a Sri Lankan audience, you're trying to write to the UK, the US, China, uh, etc. How do you balance between being able to kind of write about that complexity where someone will understand it and the local crowd will understand the nuance of it, but how do you communicate that nuance to a wider audience? Because this book was previously written as Chats with the Dead, and you had to re-edit it uh, so that it catered to that wider audience. What changed, and how, do, how did you make that kind of strike that balance? Right? where it communicates the complexity, but at the same time doesn't do injustice to the lived experiences of the locals. So that's the challenge, and I think I was blessed with such a wonderful editor. But when I write the first draft, I'm not thinking of what will an editor in London say, what will a producer in Hollywood say, because, <coughs> sorry, I, I think you, um, when you tend to write, think of your, the wider audience and write, you tend to end up writing a travel guide because if the guy is having a kottu, I have to explain what a kottu roti is. If he's having arak, I have to explain that. And suddenly it stalls the plot. So I, I write for you know readers like myself or, or maybe readers in the subcontinent who may relate to this these experiences. And um, it's only when you get to the final draft and you're thinking of marketing, you think, okay, is this going to make sense to someone on the other side of the planet who knows nothing about left arm leg spinners or you know, Sri Lanka's 1989 atrocities. And so then you, um, I mean, I'm not a fan of glossaries and footnotes and, and also, you know, we grew up, <coughs> sorry, it's my 12th uh, lit fest and my throat is giving out. And <coughs> <coughs> um, I think you, um, you know, you, I, I think the measure of a good book is, 
not Booker Prizes or making the bestseller list. These are things out, out of your control. For me, always the measure has been, whether it's a short story, is that anyone should be able to pick it up and have an experience with it, whether they know the context or not. And so when, when you edit, and it, it quite famously struggled to get a, a, a foreign publisher or publish outside of the subcontinent. And so we made sure at least um, the rough strokes of the different political factions, so there's a chapter early on, abbreviations that spells that out, the rules of the afterlife, which I guess we take for granted in the subcontinent, but that needed explanation. So we did a lot of that, but um, I, I, I stopped short of explaining things too much. I think the way it's written, you can, because I mean, my Italian translator, and sorry, my Greek translator called me up and said, what's the difference between ade, ado, aio, apo? And um, how do you explain that? I said, well, it's kind of like, hey, yo, ya. And, but you know, you can't, and in the end, you just say it's just explanation. Aio is about uh, lamentation. Ado is something, it's just a greeting. And you can, but you don't want to explain that in the book. I think you get it with the context. So. It's a bit of a high wire act, but. OK, uh, thank you very much, Shahan. Uh, we'll now take some audience questions. Uh, so if you have questions, please raise your hands, and uh, one of our volunteers uh, will pass on a, a mic. Uh, we've got two questions here, so if we can pass one over there. Hi. Uh, thanks so much for coming. Uh, it's really nice to have you in Hong Kong. So I think the character I connected with the most in the book was Jackie. And I'd like to talk about uh, how did you build out the rest of Molly's world, and also why did you choose to celebrate platonic relationships? So I think one. So so one of the comments by the editor was, "Okay, let's make it." <coughs> <coughs> Sorry about this. <coughs> uh, let's make this, yeah, clearer to a Western reader, but. One of the main comments that came through with many of my readers is Mali Almeida's a bit of a prick. He's not very likable. <laughs> and I'm not sure that's remedied even in the final draft. Um, and I'm not sure you have to have a likable protagonist. But um, I think when we edited it, um, we looked at, OK, maybe you need to understand why he is the way he is. And so we d looked at his relationships, how poorly he treated um, his lover and his best friend. and. Um, I think that, that was a major edit and a quite a subtle edit and quite a difficult one to kind of, uh, and also his relationship with his mom, his daddy issues and all that, that I think was much later on when we tried to at least humanize him and, and understand him. And I think, um, yeah, I, I like Jackie as well. I'm not a big fan of Dee Dee or Marley that, I don't think I'd want to hang out with them, but Jackie seems quite a noble character. And another, um, another edit was, I mean, there's, without giving you spoilers, there's a, significant subplot with Jackie getting into danger and that jeopardy and and the idea that suddenly Mali has to do something selfless, this kind of self-centered, arrogant guy throughout the book has to actually do something selfless to for someone he loved. And I think it was more about fleshing out Mali's character through his relationships. But yeah, in the end, Jackie becomes quite a, I'd say the heroine of the book or one of the heroines of the book and and she, but the motivation for, for writing her and was to, through her, that relationship to reflect who Mali was and to maybe chart some of his journey. Yes, sir. <coughs> yes, thank you very much for coming. I have to confess, I, I listened to your book on Audible, 26 and a half hours. <laughs> and it's a compliment to your writing that when the book is read, it's a beautiful story. I'm troubled just by one small detail and since I have your attention, I'm going to ask you about this. Why did Molly's Dada go to Missouri? <laughs> Not Iowa. Uh, <laughs> Kansas, Missouri, yeah. Well, I, I, I spent a lot of time in Iowa earlier this year writing my third novel, and um, yeah, the, I've got a thing for the Midwest. Iowa's a, you know, it's, it's a very famous, um, writing school and uh, writer's program. And I often wondered, why Iowa? And I realized, um, you know, the weather's pretty crappy. There's not much to do, so you end up writing. <laughs> and um, yeah, I mean, that's my affection with Iowa. I, I don't know where Missouri came from, Kansas, Missouri. We're not in Kansas. I don't know. But um, yeah, his dad's a strange guy. And 
he ended up, uh, yeah, going on that helicopter waving to his son while he went off to Missouri, yeah. Okay, uh, any other questions? Yes. Uh, could you uh, yeah, use a mic, sure. please? Sorry. Yeah. The great David Guerrero, <laughs> advertising legend. Yes. Thank uh, you. Yeah. <laughs> Jihan, yeah, so if you ever want a job back in advertising, you know, you can uh -huh. got, no, um, <laughs> I, I was, what I was I'd really uh, struck by, you know, the things, uh, uh, part of the themes in what you read out uh, was the, other, the, the what you can say in fiction that maybe you can't get away with in nonfiction and the things you're able to discuss, uh, particularly at the colonial history of Sri Lanka, for example. I can imagine be quite difficult to put into a sort of serious nonfiction study of the 1989 troubles or whatever. But you can say these things in fiction, and maybe I don't know. Do you want to talk about how how the is it was it a, a liberating is it a liberating experience to do that? You know, and and then does it still get you into trouble anyway? So that's, <laughs> that's what, so I'm wondering no. about yeah. No, no, fiction is a great thing to hide behind, and I, I'm not a very good journalist. I'm a yeah, I'm a copywriter. So we. Um, we, and it's it's a curious uh, dichotomy because a copywriter where we you know you know we're we're telling we're telling lies but we're trying to pass them off as truths <laughs> or insights and all that we're presenting and the facts mm -hmm. in a, in a uh, but way. yeah yeah but uh, but with this you're telling blatant lies you know you know you're talking about talking animals and ghosts but within that you're trying to tell the truth but yes, I do f look I'm I'm a really bad journalist like I I I do a bit of travel writing and I. Uh, you know, I shouldn't say this on stage, but my first travel assignment was covering dolphins in Kalpitiya, and uh, I went uh, there for like a whole week. Didn't see. A, I, I woke up at four in the morning, and I go out to see. Didn't see a single dolphin. And um, wh what are you supposed to do? You can't file your copy about a guy who never saw a dolphin. So I ended up uh, looking at pictures of dolphins and talking to people <laughs> who'd seen dolphins, and I wrote this beautiful, evocative piece uh, about thousands of dolphins jumping up and down <laughs> at sunset. And then my journalist friend said, you idiot, dolphins don't turn up at sunset. What, <laughs> what did you do? But I, o I would always go for the, the, fi the, the beautiful fiction rather than the truth. And I, and I think it is true, though. Like if, um, see, journalists get a much harder time in Sri Lanka. And uh, even though you know, we've been emboldened by the Aragale, and it, w it was very strange because you know, 10 years ago, we feared this regime, and we were, you know, and for good reason, journalists were killed in broad daylight, would go missing. But yes, 10 years later, we were emboldened to, you know, you saw on Twitter the way that we were mocking our leaders and on the streets. And I do feel that, especially fiction writers in English, we get a pass, because uh, if I was writing in Sinhala or Tamil, and a lot of, Singular writers have been jailed for writing things that are not palatable to the wider populace. But uh, I think, yeah, one thing, like, because I, I do, I criticize the flag, which, as an ad man, you know, the Sri Lankan flag, the layout, I mean, it's got so many colors, it's got so many elements, and, and all that. And I criticize it, and people say, well, why are you criticizing the flag? Like, it's not me, it's Mali Almeida. That, <laughs> that dude is out of control, and he's, uh, he just, and so you have that excuse that it's not my opinion, and and even with the first book, I was writing from the point of view of a 64-year-old man. I was in my early 30s from a different generation, much more conservative, different attitudes to me. So you, you have the luxury to be able to hide behind a narrator and say these things that you couldn't say. If I did a critique, a, a, a piece of journalism, critiquing the flag, critiquing colonialism, and so on, yeah, I would be up for that scrutiny. So this is a convenient thing, and it is a privilege, I think, that English writers enjoy. Um, but yeah, and I, I'm, I'm happy to stick in my lane. I'm not uh, yeah, in danger of getting into journalism anytime soon, no. And, and, and how surreal was it for some of the actual characters who played a part in the government in, the 19, in 1989, 90 era, to be congratulating you about this book that is based in that period now after winning the booker? I won't name names, but... well. There are not many of them around, right? Some I mean, of them are in there's touch. one of them who's in a quite a prominent position. Um, yes, um, the thing is this. I mean, one one reason why I'm so productive is I don't go on social media. I tweet once a year, uh, simply because, you know, crafting a headline, right? I take like six months to craft a tweet. By which time, you know, <laughs> Prince Harry's biography is no longer news, and so uh, and so that's one. 
one reason. So I, I don't tweet back, but yeah, when this happened, where, I mean, there was outpouring of um, congratulations, and yeah, all the different politicians would um, congratulate me, and um, I kept silent, but the Twitter mob kind of piled onto them and saying, hey, have you read the book? This is uh, you guys he's talking about and all that. So I let, I let Twitter do my work for me. It was surreal, but I think my excuse is, yeah, I don't answer tweets, and, and so I, I, yeah, I keep silent. I think it's, it's, it's much more productive doing it that way. Okay, so I, I've, I've, I've been given the signal to start wrapping up. Uh, do we have time for one more question or? Okay, I insist, one more question. Uh, yes, uh, right at the back, please. In the middle. If you can keep your hand up, then our volunteers will bring a mic. Well, I'll be signing books for a little while, so you can come and have a chat after. Yeah. Hi, Shahan. Hi. <laughs> I have actually have a question for my mother from back home, huh. Hiranti, yes. as you know. Yes. <laughs> So she says, the book forced me to take a hard look at what our country has become. It was like looking at the mirror and seeing all the flaws close up. But we're stuck in a system where the individual is powerless. So the question is, was your choice of a ghost as the protagonist a metaphor for this powerlessness? A person who sees but can do little to change. Wow, that's a great reading, <laughs> Auntie Hinanti. I know, um, that's why I can't take credit um, for it. <laughs> yeah, I so well, I hadn't thought about the... For me, it was just the ghosts of Sri Lanka's past. That was the metaphor. But um, yeah, again, without giving too much away, Mali is pretty powerless throughout it, and he feels that. And uh, yeah, maybe he is able to exert some level of power, but um, in the end, he realized the world will go on without him. And um, I think, yeah, that's, that's quite a valid reading. And yeah, I'd accept that. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Shahan, uh, that was a wonderful chat, and hopefully everyone else uh, enjoyed it as well. Uh, you are now due a very much deserved break. I hope you enjoy New Zealand. Sri Lanka is touring. Uh, the cricket team is touring yes, there as well. Yes, they are. Yes, so they I are. hope you get some time to uh, watch them play. Um, and, and it's been a pleasure to uh, speak with you, and thank you very much, and all the best uh, with you in the future, uh, with your novels and other writing as well. But And also, no pressure, the last... Booker Prize winner by a Sri Lankan, The English Patient, also won an Oscar. Ah. <laughs> wow. So, you okay. know? Okay. <laughs> Thank you so much, Kitkira. It's been a pleasure. Thank you very much. Thank yeah. you very much, everyone. Thank Have you. a great yeah. evening. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you, Shihan, and thank you, Kitkira. Um, I think this is probably one of those times where I'm going to wrap up the session and get booed by everybody um, because I certainly could have carried on listening. So thank you. That was a real pleasure. Um, Shihan is going to hang around at the back and sign some copies. He does have to run to the airport, so he's going to have to be a little bit brisk. So I know there's a whole load of fans in here, but please just try and keep the line moving for him so that he can meet as many of you as possible. So thank you so much for coming. We're here all week. Thank you. Good night.